Uh, well, I'm super, super excited. Uh, I've been asked for years to do a study in the book of Ruth, and I've always said no uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I finally was coerced. And so we are, we're going to be diving into an eight-part series <clears throat> uh, in the book of Ruth. And so I have just been, I've been so excited, and I have spent so much time already uh, just studying and delighting myself in this little tiny book. Uh, so what I want to do in this evening's study is kind of give a broad overview of the book. Uh, we're basically just going to look at the first two verses, set the scene of where we're going with this whole thing, and then that'll help us as we uh, get into the future studies, and we'll actually dive into the rest of chapter one uh, in, the next, in the next study. Uh, so as you look over at this little tiny book called the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, uh, so this is what Paulus Castle said about the little book of Ruth. He says, the little book of Ruth, the exposition of which usually follows that of the book of Judges, consists of only 85 verses. But these enclose a garden of roses, as fragrant and full of mystic flowers, as those which the modern traveler still finds blooming and twining about the solitary ruins of Israel and Moab, this side of Jordan and beyond. The significance and beauty of the brief narrative cannot be highly enough estimated, whether regard be had to the thought that fills it, the historical value which marks it, or the pure and charming form in which it is set forth. Well, listen, listen to what William McDonald says. He says, it is noteworthy that the two books in the Bible named after women, one was a Jewish girl who married a prominent Gentile, Esther and King Ahiraris, or Xerxes. Uh, and the other was a Gentile woman who married a prominent Hebrew, Ruth and Boaz. Another significant thing about these two women have in common is that both were part of God's redemptive history. God used Esther to save his people from physical destruction, and he used Ruth as an important genealogical link in the messianic line, first to David and ultimately to Christ, who would save his people from their sins. Isn't that a neat thought? That of all the books we have, only two are mentioned, or two are named after women, and both of those books have this beautiful declaration of God's redemptive plan in the world today. Uh, and I just, I'm going to throw this out as a teaser to look at in a future study, but listen to what Chuck Missler says. He says, Ruth, the book, is one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible. And I don't know about you, but when I think of the book of Ruth, I don't usually think of prophecy. So let me just kind of give a broad overview. And I'm just teasing some of this stuff out and we'll again dive into this as we progress. Uh, the author of the book of Ruth, almost across the board, uh, we are told in the Jewish writings that it was Samuel. And so the idea is that here is Samuel, he's writing the book of Judges, Ruth, and then first, first and second Samuel, or at least first Samuel. And in terms of a broad outline, I want to give you two fun uh, outlines that I really appreciate. One is this idea of a focus of faith, where you're looking at the book through the lens of faith, which is kind of a neat idea uh, in light of all, all that we do here. Uh, but basically, chapter 1, verse 1 through 18 is a test of faith, testing the men, the women uh, in Judea and in, in, in Moab. Uh, chapter 1, verse 19 through chapter 4, verse 12 is the perseverance of faith. So the persevering of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. And then chapter 4, verse 13 through the end of the book is the reward of faith. So it's the reward of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. I just thought it's a neat picture of looking at the book through this lens of faith. The other one is the one I've used for years. It's, I, love, I love the language and I love the alliteration. Uh, and it's, it's Chuck Missler's. And basically, he, he breaks it into the four chapters. So chapter 1 is love's resolve. Chapter two is love's response. Chapter, chapter three is love's request. And chapter four is love's reward, which I think just summarizes the book in a very beautiful way. Now, for all the nerds, which I know there's a few, but for the rest of you, just hang tight. Uh, I, I want to just point out something that I just think is majestic in the book, especially if you're a nerd, which is the chiastic structure of Ruth. Uh, a, chi a chiasm, uh, it's named after the Greek letter, which means an X. So the idea is that you have these uh, parallels that parallel each other, and they go down to a point. And what's really neat about the book of Ruth is the entire book becomes a chiasm. So see if this will make sense. Uh, Peter Lau says this, although the plot is chronologically linear, the book of Ruth evidence is a chiastic structure. So here's what he gives. Now, I, this looks like a lot of information, and it is. And for someone listening online, you'll just have to or listening to the audio, you have to come and get the notes or listen to, or look at the video. Uh, but basically what you'll see is that line A matches line A, uh, what is that called, an apostrophe, A with apostrophe? And you'll start to notice that you start having these parallel lines 
And they all start zooming into one key moment, which is the line F and F with, the, with a quote, uh, which is this, all, this whole idea of Naomi. Here, here's the whole purpose of this. What's really neat is the whole book has this beautiful structure, but right at the center of the structure, you actually have the main focus of the book, which strangely is not Ruth, it's Naomi. So even though it is Ruth's story, it actually is an exposition on the life of Naomi, which we're going to keep expanding on over the next several weeks. But I, I bring that up because I just think it's a, such a great insight or thought of the, this little tiny book that we often will miss. And again, if you want to study this more, take a picture or look at it later. <laughs> uh, Peter Luke Lau goes on and says this, the narrative is artfully structured. The four chapters correspond to the four acts of the plot with each act composed of three scenes. The narrative plot pivots on the pair at pair of scenes at the center of this narrative, line F, both of which focus on the words of the narrative's central character, Naomi. The chiastic stru structure also highlights the reversals in the Ruth narrative. The reversals include death to life, childless widowhood to marriage and family, threat and extinction, extinction to the kingdom, exclusion to belonging, and shame to honor. And in other words, the chiasm actually shows this phenomenal redemption and how everything is working from despair to praise and, and honor and glory, which is what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. Uh, just a couple of things in terms of the literary structure. And sorry that all this is technical stuff. I'm trying to get all this out of the way so we can actually get into the text. But this is some broad stuff that's just helpful to understand. In terms of literary structure, uh, Manser says this, Ruth begins with a prologue of 70, 71 words in Hebrew, which is chapter 1, 1 through 5. And listen to this. And it ends with an epilogue of 71 words in Hebrew. Isn't that beautiful? It, like, it is perfectly structured. In between, there are four scenes with a turning point right in the middle, which is chapter 2, verse 20, where Naomi says, the man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. And there is, that is the key theme and focus of the entire book. Naomi is the central character, but that declaration she makes is so profound because that is what the entire book hinges upon. Uh, Manser goes on and says, this is the key to the story. It is a story of redemption. Barry Webb says this, episodes or chapters two and three at the center of the book are in structural parallel. In both of them, Ruth leaves Naomi in the morning, has an encounter with Boaz and returns to her in the evening. In an article on the structure of Ruth, Stephen Burtman has identified no fewer than five major matching elements in these two chapters. So in other words, when you look at chapters two and three, you have this wonderful symmetry that is going on. So at the very beginning, you have uh, Naomi and Ruth talking about her, uh, Ruth leaving. Then you have Ruth leaving, and then you have Boaz asking who Ruth is, and she, she tells him. And then you have Boaz asking Ruth uh, a question, and, and then at the end, Ruth gives that report back to Naomi. Now you'll notice that number one and number four are slightly different, but they form this incredibly beautiful parallel uh, in the structure of chapters two and three. So on the bookends, you have these, this prologue epilogue of 71 words in Hebrew. And then in the center, you have this beautiful symmetry where you have this repetition going on in, in, in the middle of the book. And then one other thought in terms of just big structure stuff, uh, the location or the placement of Ruth in the Bible is super profound. And it actually gives you an insight into interpreting the text. And we do this in three ways. Uh, let me give you this quick quote, because I think it'll help us set this into kind of uh, perspective. Uh, Peter Lau in Gregory Gospel says this, the book of Ruth is one of a number of Old Testament books that are placed in more than one position in various biblical canons. So other prominent examples being Chronicles, Lamentations, and Daniel. In Hebrew canonical orders, Ruth is found in the third canonical division called the writings and put either before the Psalms as a kind of biography of the Psalmist David, or more often placed after Proverbs, making the heroine Ruth an example of that excellent wife or worthy woman found in Proverbs 31. In Greek order, Ruth comes right after Judges in an apparent effort to put it in its historical setting because the story is set in the days when the Judges ruled. So let me just summarize that. I think this is so profound. So in our Bibles, the Christian canon, Ruth is placed after the book of Judges, and that should make sense to us because that is where it actually fits historically. It's in the time of Judges, so we put it in the historical books after the book of Judges. 
But again, if you go back into how the Jews organized their Bible, which is slightly different than how we do it uh, in, in ours, when you look at the Jewish writings, sometimes it's placed right before Psalms, right? So it's given a declaration of who David is and his lineage. And more profoundly, it is found more commonly, I should say, right after the book of Proverbs. So if you're reading along in Hebrew, you read Proverbs 31, right? The virtuous woman, and then you see a virtuous woman in the book of Ruth. And it is the only example in scripture where you actually have a woman named as a virtuous woman. And there's, Ruth is actually called a virtuous woman in the book. So it becomes super profound in light of that position. So let me give you this great quote. I thought this was beautiful. So in the Jewish writings, this is not the quote. Let me, this is just my summary. Uh, so the Jewish writings. So it, Ruth is placed within the, what's called the five scrolls that are read during the yearly Jewish holidays. So here are the five books. Song of Solomon is read during Passover. Ruth is read during Shavuot or called Pentecost. Lamentations is read during Tisha B'av. Ecclesiastes is read during Sukkot or called the Feast of Tabernacles. And Esther is read during Purim. So these five books are often grouped together in the Jewish writings. And Ruth is often the first of those five scrolls and it's placed after Proverbs, which again, beautifully ties it to the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. So here's what Michael Welshler says about this position next to Proverbs 31. I thought this was so beautiful with the parallels. He says, Ruth immediately follows Proverbs, thus highlighting the canonical thematic link between the last pericope in Proverbs, describing the ideal, quote, woman of valor, Proverbs 31 verse 10, and Ruth. She is the only real biblical woman to whom that expression is applied. See Ruth 3.11. As therefore might be expected, the various positive qualities and actions that characterize that woman of valor in Proverbs 31 are associated with Ruth at various points throughout the narrative. In some instances, even employing the same terminology. Thus, the woman of valor rises early in the morning to set about her work. Proverbs 31 verse 5. As does Ruth. See Ruth 2.7 and 3.14. The woman of valor works with dogged industriousness, Proverbs 31, verse 27, as does Ruth, Ruth 2, 7, and verse 17. The woman of valor is not dissuaded from difficult tasks, but rather girds herself with strength, Proverbs 31, 17, as does Ruth, Ruth 2, verses 17 through 18. The woman of valor always takes thought to supply her family needs, Proverbs 31, 15, as does Ruth, Ruth 2, verse 14 and 18. The woman of valor is characterized by teaching that exemplary doing of hesed or loving kindness, Proverbs 31, 26, as is Ruth, Ruth 1, 8 and 3, 10. The woman of valor is blessed by her husband, Proverbs 31, verse 28, as is Ruth by her, quote, husband-to-be in Ruth 3, 10. And because of her works, the woman of valor is praised in the gates, which Proverbs 31, 31 says, as well as Ruth 3, 11. Isn't that profound? So as you're looking at this, picture of the Proverbs 31 woman of valor, it's like in, in the Hebrew writing collection, it's like, okay, let me show you what that looks like. And gives us Ruth, which strangely is a Gentile. So you have a Gentile example of a virtuous woman, which I just think is delightfully hilarious uh, to the Jews. <laughs> so let's get into a little portion of the book of Ruth. And I want to look at the first two verses. Uh, if you ever read a newspaper, which we don't do that anymore, but back in the old days, uh, when you would get the newspaper, the first sentence of a newspaper article was called the lead, and it was often considered the most important. And in other words, you wanted to put all the key details of that article in the very first sentence, which begins to flow out uh, the whole article. Well, that is very true in the book of Ruth. What you see in the first two verses is like a newspaper, newspaper lead that gives you all of this information packed really closely, and then it begins to expound upon it. So look at the first two verses. Now it happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the fields of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of the wife, Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malon and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they came to the fields of Moab and remained there. Uh, there is so much packed in these two little verses. And I just want to look at two key aspects of this with you. One is the locations and two is the names. I've mentioned this so many times in other series, but do you realize that names are so important in scripture? A lot of times there is play on words in the names. 
In other words, a name wasn't just a name. Like, you know, we just call kids Bob and Susie, Susie and Josephine and Jaquita and Bertha, whatever, right? And, and we have, the names are important and hey, they're, they're wonderful. But biblically, a name was more than just a name. A name, as one author said, is someone's autobiography in one word. So when you look at the meaning of a name, whether it's a location or whether it's a person, it often says something about that individual or that location. And again, there's a lot of fun play on words. And that is certainly true in the book of Ruth. There is, I think every name is a great play on word, uh, play on words in light of what is happening in the context. So with that being said, let me introduce you to this cast of characters in the book of Ruth. Now in verse one and two, we are introduced to this man by the name of Elimelech, whose name is God is my king. Now that's really significant because this is in the days of judges where no one is king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so there's this delightful play on words that here's Elimelech saying, "Woo, God is my king and I'm going to trust him. And what do you see Elimelech not doing? Not trusting because he goes to the foreign land rather than staying in Bethlehem, trusting his God. He is married to this woman named Naomi, which means pleasant, sweet, delight, beautiful, amiable, or the gracious. And this, she actually has her own play on words as you come into uh, chapter two, or I mean the end of chapter one, where she even says, don't call me pleasant or sweet anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter because the Lord dealt bitterly with me. So she actually flips her own name and says, I'm no longer sweet. I'm now full of bitterness. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, then they have two kids, which have horrible names. Uh, one is named Malon, which means unhealthy, great infirmity, to blot out, sick, weak, or diseased. <laughs> Could you imagine having a kick kid named Sickly? And then his brother, uh, Killian or Chilean, means puny, to perish, pining, wasting away, finished, or complete. His name means deathly. Could you imagine calling your kids for dinner? Hey, Sickly, go get deathly. It's time to eat. You know, it's just like... <laughs> You know, the whole thing's just problematic. Uh, here's what one author said about their names. Uh, Samuel Rideout says this. The names of the two sons seem to show both the unbelief of the father and the results of God's chastening. Instead of giving them names suggesting his goodness and love, the parent fastens upon them that which was a temporary cloud and thus render it permanently by their unbelief and prophetic of the final and sorrowful culmination. In other words, uh, it seems to be that they were going through difficult times or these kids weren't uh, born healthy and therefore they got these names. Because again, the birthing situation defined a lot of how someone was named. But it is interesting as you move into the story, there is a delightful play on words because here it is a time of famine. They're in the place of Moab and what ends up happening to these sons? Well, they get sick and die, which is their names. So again, there's a fun play on words uh, in this whole thing. Now, there are three other characters that we are going to meet later in chapter one, but let me just introduce you to them. Ruth, who is married to Malon, her name means desirable, beautiful, friend, something worth seeing and satisfied. And she actually lives up to that name. Uh, her, the other wife uh, of Killian is Orpah, which means mane. It's literally the neck of an animal. Or it could also mean fawn, a young doe, a gazelle, or hardened and double-minded which you see that coming into play in her response. And then you have the man whose name is Boaz and his name means in him, Yahweh is strength, which becomes really neat as you get into, I think it's chapter three, because we find that he is a great man of valor. In other words, he is living up to his name. Uh, in fact, one of the pillars of Solomon's temple was named Boaz uh, in light of this whole thing. So that is our cast of characters. So let's look at the locations really quick. Uh, several locations are mentioned in Ruth chapter 1, verse 2. It says, They were Ephrodites of Bethlehem and Judah, and they came to the fields of Moab and remained there. Uh, the word Ephrata, which is the root of the Ephrodites, uh, a lot of scholars say it was the ancient name of Bethlehem, meaning fruitfulness. Some have also said it may have been a very specific clan who lived outside of, of Bethlehem. In other words, it was one of the prominent clans uh, in this area. Uh, it was like the descendant of uh, Caleb, kind of an idea, right? It's like one of the major families of ancient Israel. So maybe one of the clans. E either way, it's often synonymous throughout scripture with the place of Bethlehem itself. Then you have Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, which is a little ironic because there's a famine in the house of bread, which means there's no bread in the house of bread. Isn't that a great play on words? I think that is delightful. 
And it says that it's in this place called Judah, which means praise. <clears throat> so for, for those who are visual, uh, here is a picture of the area around the Dead Sea. So the Mediterranean would be off to the left. And you'll notice that Jerusalem is kind of like right, if you go to the top of the Dead Sea and go left, it sits right left or uh, west of the Dead Sea. But right there, about five to six miles south of Jerusalem is this little town called Bethlehem. <clears throat> Here is what it looks like today. This is a picture from the north uh, looking at the fields of Bethlehem. Uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it sits on the edge of the wilderness, so it's a great place to raise flocks and sheep and herds and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is an aerial view from the north of modern day Bethlehem. Uh, but this would be the shepherding area of this ancient culture, also where they had wheat and barley. Uh, John Walton mentions that this area of Bethlehem generally produced wheat, barley, almonds, uh, and grapes. It was very productive in that arena outside of the, the, the sheep thing. And it says that they left that because of the famine to go to this place called Moab. Now, Moab means the water of the father. Uh, in other words, it has this idea of like seed or progeny, desire. It's the progeny of a father. It's, and there's it's the descendants of a father. Uh, it also means waste and nothingness. <laughs> Isn't that miserable? You guys aren't getting the humor yet. Okay. Uh, and this is what John Walton says about uh, the location of Moab. Uh, Moab is situated east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. It's in the modern day Jordan, uh, which by the way is about 50 to 75 miles east of Bethlehem. Uh, it received an annual rainfall of about 16 inches a year, which provided a number of perennial springs and rivers. The sudden rise of the winds from the depths of the Jordan Valley could wrest more moisture out of the clouds. Hence, Moab often sustained or escaped a famine. So it makes sense that if there's this major famine going on in the land of Israel, that there is this enticement to the land of Moab because, well, maybe they're, they're at least have a little bit of water so that the crops will grow. Uh, again, here's our Bethlehem right up there on the west of the Dead Sea. There's this thing called the Plains of Moab, which is not where they would have gone. I just pointed out that there is this area right to the east of the Dead Sea, which is called the Plains of Moab. But Moab itself sits down in the southern eastern part of the Dead Sea. So it's in modern day Jordan. It's right across the mountains. It's in that region uh, of the world. Again, it's about a 50 to 75 mile journey, which would have taken them probably three, to three days to a week to get there if they're actually moving over there. Uh, here is what Moab uh, looks like. Doesn't it look enticing? Don't you look at that and go, wow, I want to move there. There are goats, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so it's in this mountain area and there would at least been some uh, harvest ability <clears throat> in that area. The timing becomes really interesting. There's, there's two notations of timing. Uh, one, we know that they're in Moab for 10 years. That's what uh, the middle of Ruth chapter one tells us. But here's the two other things to, to note about timing. And I'm not going to talk about them. I just want you to know it on the front end. So that as we work through this book, we'll talk about it at the very end. But I want you to have this in mind as we're walking through this study. So Naomi and Ruth, at the end of chapter one, arrive back to Bethlehem at what is typically called Passover or first fruits. It's the beginning of barley harvest, chapter one, verse 22. So it starts with Passover and the book concludes with Pentecost. It's the end of the barley harvest. That becomes super significant. In other words, the entire book is happening between Passover and Pentecost. Now, if you just lay this on top of the New Testament and what happened in the New Testament between those times, it gets really interesting. I just want you to mull this over as we're walking through this. And I mentioned this earlier, but the scroll of Ruth is read on Shavuot, which is the feast of Pentecost, which strangely is the only feast of the seven, which uses leavened bread, which becomes really significant. Why? Because we're talking about the house of bread. Does it make sense? So I just want you to hold these things. And again, we'll talk about it more as we progress here. So there's three key themes I want you to notice as we get into this. One is this idea of redemption. The word redeemer, redeem, or redemption shows up 21 times in this little book, which is incredibly significant. This is the central theme of the book. Uh, another major theme that runs kind of underscored through the entire book is this idea of hesed or this word loving kindness. And I, uh, though I'd love to talk about it, we'll get to it eventually.
Okay. So if you've ever studied Hesed or loving kindness, that word shows up three times, but it's like this major underscore of everything that is happening in this book. And there's also this beautiful theme of this idea of virtue of character, specifically of Boaz, as mentioned in chapter two, verse one, and Ruth, chapter three, verse 11. And so we'll start to see how their characters and their response to everything uh, becomes this incredible picture. And there's a couple key tensions or issues that you need to know that sets up this entire book. And the reason I, I need to go through these now is because these three things underscore everything we're going to be talking about in the, in the studies to come. So I, I want you to get a hold of, hold of these key tensions. Number one is this idea that it's during the time of Judges. Um, that becomes so significant to our understanding of the book of, book of Ruth. At the very end of Judges, this is the very last verse of the book of Judges. Uh, this is Judges 21 verse 25. It sa says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that plays into what we see going on in the book of Ruth. And there's Ruth is happening in the middle of this day where there is no king of Israel and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. By the way, that shows up several times in the book of Judges. It's one of the key themes of Judges. Why was the season of Judges falling apart? It's because there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, listen to Proverbs 12, verse 15. Uh, Solomon says, the way of an ignorant fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So if you start to reason from your own perspective and do what is right in your own eyes, Proverbs says, you're an idiot, which describes the book of Judges really well and our culture. Uh, Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the hearts. Uh, listen to what Dean Ulrich says about this idea of what is the time of Judges. He says, The historical, social, and religious context for what follows the time of Judges was not the best of times. In fact, the dark days of the Judges was closer to the worst of times in Old Testament history. Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, whom the reader meets in the opening verses, lived during a time of apostasy and justice and tumult. The book of Judges ends on a pessimistic note. The whole book presents a people rotting at the core. From a covenantal perspective, nothing is the way it is supposed to be. He goes on and says, what began as a complacency and tolerance became apostasy. In his study of Judges, Dale Ralph Davis used the expression, it's a generation degeneration which certainly captures the point. In other words, the whole generation was degrading. <clears throat> Israelite society during the days of Judges has lost all sense of decency, justice, commitment, and protection. In short, it had forgotten how to love. Even so, the book of Judges does more than describe a people that are sick unto death. It also hints at better days to come. Throughout this third section, starting in chapter 17 through the end of the book, a refrain repeatedly puts forth monarchy as the solution to moral chaos. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Because the writer of Judges believed that anarchy prevails in the absence of a king, the book of Judges, especially chapters 17 through 21, prepares the reader for kingship. I don't, for some reason, I had never seen that in the book of Judges. Like I've, I've seen the fact that, okay, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But I didn't recognize until I was studying all this that actually what the, what, uh, what, uh, Samuel is doing in the book of Judges is preparing you to see your absolute necessity for a king. And then he presents the story of Ruth of why David is that true and rightful king. And so though the people asked for Saul, he was actually not God's first choice. Had they waited, they would have gotten David. But there's this idea that when there's not a king and everyone does what is right in his own eyes, there is absolute chaos. So the book is begging this idea of we need a king. Do you know what's going to solve the issue? A king. And by the way, do you know that that's a great picture of our modern day? Everyone is doing what is right in, our, in his own eyes today. Do you know what the solution is? The king of kings. And wouldn't it be neat if we didn't live from our own perspective, but if we actually allowed the God of the universe to actually be our perspective and the king of all kings could actually sit upon the throne of this world once again? Uh, Earl Rick says this in terms of tying it into our modern day. He says, 21st century readers should be able to identify with the period of the judges. Our contemporary thinkers and uh, uh, analysis, an, an, what's the word? 
Yeah, that. <laughs> I know why I can't say that. Analysis. No, I can't say it. The people who come up with these great thoughts. Uh, they say that we live in a postmodern age. Postmodernism uh, rejects the notion of absolute truth, universal norms, and ultimate coherence. But how similar are our times to the days of the judges when everyone did what was right in his or her eyes? Uh, Carolyn Custis James says this in the same concept. She says, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz also lived in tumultuous time. The global stage was dominated by political instability, penetrated national borders, gender inequality, racial disparity, international tensions, economic crisis, injustice, violence, wars, and natural disasters. In the days when the judges ruled is hardly a favorable beginning. Isn't it interesting how much of our day sounds like the book of Judges? In terms of everything's unstable, there's all this crisis, all these rumors of wars, everyone's doing what is right in his own eyes. And again, what's the solution? We actually need a king. We need Jesus to be king and Lord, not just of our lives, but of our country and our world. Amen. Uh, another key issue or tension in this entire book is not just uh, this, this idea <clears throat> uh, with the time of Judges, but it's this idea of Moab. Uh, Moab is not a good place, biblically. Uh, again, it says that they came to this place and remained in the fields of Moab, Ruth 1 verse one and two. The word sojourn, that they sojourned to Moab, that word has this idea of like a, being a resident alien. Uh, the Hebrew word gives the idea of living among people who are not blood relatives as a foreigner. In other words, you don't have civil rights within the land, but are dependent upon the hospitality of the country. The word indicates it was not a permanent residency. They were just going to go for a little while. But then at the end of verse two, it says that they remain there, which gives this idea of, well, Let's just stay. And they settled down. Hey, they, 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 they started a farm. They got married. They, they lived in Moab. And the, in, the progression of that is so interesting, which started as a, well, let's just get out of the famine. Let's just spend a little bit of time. Ended up being the place that they remained until everyone died and there was food back in Bethlehem. So listen to this idea. Uh, Robert Hubbard says this. Uh, speaking of that phrase, remain there at the very end of, uh, verse 2, by omitting the time reference, which commonly accompanied the formula, the author suggested that their sojourn in Moab would be an indefinite duration. So it started as a temporary sojourn, became this, we're just here. How long? I don't know. We'll be here until, we're, until we leave. And there's this, there's this idea and tension in the text that as you get to the end of verse 2, you're like, uh-oh, they're going to be there a while, which is the whole idea. They're there for 10 years. Uh, J. Andrew Dearman says this, It is assumed by the narrator that because of the famine, Elimelech had exhausted his resources before leaving Bethlehem and that someone else had to use, had use of his property. Now, here's the problem with Moab. We would just see like, well, what's, what's the big deal about going to Mexico or Canada? It's not that big of a deal. But Moab is a whole nother deal, folks. Uh, when you go back to the very beginning, Moab came about, and I'm not going to go into detail because it's horrible, but if you remember when Lot leaves Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He ends up going to Zoar, they kick him out, and so he and his daughters make their way up to the mountains, which is where they were told to go in the first place. And the daughters get Lot drunk, and they end up getting pregnant, and what came out of that sordid scene is two of the worst enemies of Israel. You have the Ammonites and you have the Moabites. So one was named Moab, one was named Ammon. Uh, here's what Genesis 19.37 says. And the firstborn, speaking of Lot's daughter, bore a son and called his name Moab, for he is the father of the Moabites to this day. And what you begin to see is that everything that Moab does is not good. They are a picture of the flesh, and they are literally standing in resistance against God Almighty. They're also a place of curse and compromise. In other words, Balaam, the prophet, was hired by Balak, who is the king of Moab, to curse the Israelites. But because Balaam can't curse them, he still wants the money. So he, was, he, uh, he encouraged Balak to intermarry within, uh, within the Israelites. So because God would not let Balaam curse Israel, Balaam says, can I still have the money if I tell you how to, how to destroy them? And Balak gives the money and Balaam suggests, why don't you intermarry? So here's, here's what... Numbers 25 records out of this whole thing. 
It says, and Israel remained at Shittim and the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Indeed, they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Bela Peor and the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel. And they talk about this plague. And so therefore 24,000 people died in that plague. Moab is not a great group. Uh, in Deuteronomy 23, it says that no Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of Yahweh, even to the 10th generation. None of their seed shall ever enter the assembly of Yahweh because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. So if you remember, Moses asked the Moabites and the Ammonites if they could pass through the land. And they said, no, you can't go through our land. You can't have our water. You can't have our food. And because they hired against you, Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor, a Mesopotamia to curse you. So God says, think about this tension. Uh, no one from Moab or Ammon is to ever be a part of Israel. Uh, we have a problem, folks, because Ruth is from Moab. What's going to happen? Not only that, you were not to marry a Gentile. Look at this, Deuteronomy 7. <clears throat> Moses says, when Yahweh your God gives them over before you, speaking of this promised land, and you strike them down, then you shall devote them to destruction. You shall cut no covenant with them and show no favor to them. <clears throat> Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. In other words, think about the problem with the book of Ruth. You have these people who are Moab who marry Moabites. Bum, bum, bum. And they literally break the old covenant law. Then everyone dies and you have Ruth going back with Naomi to Israel. So here is Ruth, a Moabitess, a Gentile woman from Moab, what hope does she have? And it becomes this incredible tension in the story. So much so that that term for Moab shows up 14 times in this little book. It's like it keeps putting it in there so you don't forget uh, Ruth, the Moabitess. Ruth from Moab. You know, Elimelech and Naomi went to Moab, the fields of Moab, and it keeps doing all this repetition. Why? To show you how significant of an issue this one is. Moab is incredibly difficult of an issue when we think about this in light of this book. So Moab is a land of compromise, contrasted to Bethlehem, which is in the land of promise. Just an interesting thought. Uh, not only that, but then two times in the Psalms, you have this statement, Moab is my wash bowl, uh, which is a cooking pot or a basin used for washing dirty feet. <laughs> in other words, it's like God saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's toilet water. Uh, Moab is like my trash can. Moab is like that ugly ring in your sink after dishes and has all that junky food. Yeah, that's Moab. God does not think highly of Moab, folks, which causes an incredible tension in the story of the book of Ruth. Uh, here's what Peter Lau says. Uh, closer to the setting of, Ruth, uh, of the Ruth narrative, there were intermittently hostile relations between the two countries, speaking of Moab and Israel. During the time of the judge, uh, Jephthah, uh, Israel worshiped the gods of Moab along with the gods of the nations, Judges 10.6. Thus, for an Israelite man to uproot his family to sojourn in Moab was both risky and shameful. The proximity of Moab may have been attractive since it was located east of the Dead Sea. Nonetheless, the negative associations with the Moabites must have made it a last resort. It would have been shameful for Elimelech to uproot his family and leave Israel. In a collectivist or a communal culture, the group has precedence over the individual. A, quote, famine in the land affected the nation. So for a man and his family to abandon his nation in a time of disaster would have been frowned upon. If the famine was God's punishment, the response should have been to repent and call others to do the same. If the famine was not punishment, God's people are enjoined to trust in him and to plead for him to break the famine. In other words, what you see is Elimelech doing the very thing he should not have been doing, which is going against the trust or not trusting uh, in his God. And the last thing I just want to mention, just to wrap up, uh, one other key tension is this idea of famine, food, and family. Do you realize that throughout this entire story, because of the famine, food and the family structure of Naomi and Ruth become significant tensions in the story? How are they going to get food and who's going to redeem the family? And I just bring that up so you have the tension as we walk this through. And just for kicks and giggles, the famine that's mentioned in the book of Ruth is one of 13 mentioned in scripture as severe famines. Uh, 
it had been serious, lasting for several years and extending over the whole line of Israel. Otherwise, they would have sojourned to another part of Israel rather than go to the country of Moab. And again, 10 years would pass before Naomi would hear that the famine had ended. And so here are five of the major famines that are mentioned in the early part of Genesis. And most scholars suggest that the book of Ruth probably happened in the time of Gideon because, again, in the book of Judges, that's the only major famine that's listed in the book of Judges. So if it's in the time of Judges, Gideon had the major famine, the likelihood is that Ruth happened in the time of Gideon. Let me give one practical application for our lives. In the middle of this famine, in the middle of this crisis, in the middle of this difficulty, here is Bethlehem, the house of bread that has no bread. And what do you see Elimelech doing? Elimelech makes this decision to leave home and you see him actually running from his problems. And you see him actually not walking in trust. Rather, he says, how can I solve my issue? And he goes to the land of Moab. So he focuses on that which is physical, that which he can physically see, not his spiritual, or not, 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 that, what it, not that which is spiritual. In other words, he's not walking by faith. He puts his hope and trust in the enemy, Moab, rather than in Yahweh. And can I ask us, isn't it interesting when we have difficulties, when we have problems in our life, what is it that we turn to? Isn't it interesting that more often than not, we do the same thing a limelight does and we try to get out of our problems. We try to run from our problems. We try to hide the problem. We try to be the self-solution to our problem rather than putting our hope and trust in our God. And so can I beseech you, even though you see God's redemptive hand through the entirety of the book of Ruth, and you see God using all of this, even Elimelech's foolish decision to go to Moab to redeem this woman named Ruth and put her in the line of Christ, do you realize that though God can use the foolishness, do you realize that we should make God our first turn? And if you're going through a famine in your life, could I exhort you to turn to Jesus first? Could I exhort you to hold tight to him and not run from him? Uh, look what the psalmist says in Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Wait for God, for I shall still praise him, the salvation of my presence and my God. The ESV says it this way. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Or why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Can I encourage you to do the same thing? Would you put your hope and trust in our God rather than turn within yourself and trying to be your own solution? Because what you see in the, in the book of Ruth is Ruth actually does this passage. She's going through great despair. There is no hope for her. And yet she's throwing all of her hope in on this God named Yahweh, which is a beautiful contrast to the very thing that Elimelech did. That being said, I am so excited to jump in this book. And I know that was long. I apologize for this first uh, study to be this long for the sake of an overview. But as we get into this stuff, I... The profundity of what God is doing and how this points to Jesus is so phenomenal. So if I can encourage you for some homework, it's only four chapters. It takes you probably 15 minutes. Can I encourage you to read the whole book a couple of times just so you get the scene and get the, get the tensions. And and I want you to start to notice what is actually happening. There are some beautiful things happening in this little tiny book that shows the redemptive reality of Christ Jesus. Well, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we love you. Thank you. Uh, for this little book. Uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, that we would not have the same response as the, the book of Judges. Lord, we live in a time when everyone seems to be doing what is right in our own eyes, and we're living in a time of crisis and instability. Lord, don't let us turn and put our hope in ourselves. Lord, I pray that we would recognize that what we actually need is a king, and you are our king. So Lord, would you allow us not to do the Elimelech thing where we run from our issues and we put our hope and trust in what we can see rather than our hope and trust in you. And Lord, we just pray that as we jump into this little book over the next several studies, Lord, I pray that you would just illuminate yourself and you would cause us to turn our gaze heavenward and that we would truly, through this Old Testament book, see Jesus Christ on every single page. Lord, we love you and we trust you and just give you the praise and the glory. In your precious, precious name we pray. Amen.